at Agape, I just feel it's not, you know, just a church where you walk in and you leave and no one notices. Um, I really feel like the people here are family and um, it's something that we're always hanging out together, we're always doing life together. So Agape is really a family-oriented church, you know. It's not a service that you just come to and, you know, get your word and then leave. So you come, you know, you meet people, you greet them, you all like get along well and you, you get in the Word of God together and then you go out and fellowship together. From the time we stepped in to the time we left, we were just overwhelmed with people. Just people fellowship, people welcoming us, people making us feel very comfortable, very much at home, very much like we were one. My favorite part about being in Agape is that um, I've never really heard the gospel the way that I've heard it here. And so it's different, and it's just it's just so wonderful, and it really it just really fills my soul. So I, I like this, and I've not seen it anywhere else. My favorite thing about Agape is being able to serve and and help with the community and help with the church. Um, and I think just being able to to serve and be in that spirit of service is, is the best part of being a part of the church. I think Agape is the greatest sense of family that you can get, and uh, it's just a great sense of community that holds you accountable and really helps you grow in your faith and and also it's just a great group to be around and they're constantly just uh, supporting you. So at worship I play the drums and uh, so that I really enjoy that and I also uh, love being part of the band and it's a great great time. So what I love about this church is the community and that we're all so close and always there for one another. Um, whenever someone's going through a rough time, you have like everyone there as a big community of sisters and brothers. I think that people should come and visit Agape because we have such an incredible, incredible and diverse group of people here. We have people from all over the world, all over the country, all over Texas, from different walks of life, different ages, and we all come together for one purpose, and that's to serve God and love each other. So I think it's a place that anyone can call home. Loving fellowship. Community. Family. Worship. Church. Love. Agape. Oh. Agape. 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 Good morning everyone. Welcome to Agape. We're so excited to have you guys with us this morning. If you could stand up and join us in a word of prayer before we begin um, and then we'll kick off with worship. Lord, I just thank you for today and that we get to be here to worship you, Lord, and hear what you have to say. I pray that you uh, are present today and that you just speak to our hearts and our minds, that uh, you fill in where we are lacking um, and that you just um, intercede and um, um, and comfort our hearts in a way that only you can, through the message or through worship or through whatever you know that we need today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you could join us in worship. No longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love. 
God is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Oh, back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, cause we're alive. And what a love we found Death can hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens 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 me Your love is greater Your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me.
greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God.
Father God, thank you so much for today, for everyone who's here this morning, Lord. I pray over your message today um, that we'll all take something away from it that helps us to grow closer to you and learn more about you, Father. Um, I pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, so good to be with you this morning and especially welcome the people who are uh, came back to be with us and those people who are with us for the first time and just want to welcome them. Uh, I, I want to continue, uh, I wasn't supposed to speak this Sunday, but I want to continue what we started last week because we didn't have enough time to cover it, about life-changing amazing grace. And during the last week we gave the illustration based on scriptures that the Word of God speaks about us before becoming the children of God being all sinners and not only sinners but enemies of God. You have to understand that uh, the verse in Romans chapter 5 where it says it says that we uh, in chapter 3 where it says all have sinned in Romans chapter 3 all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Chapter 5 it says while we are we were sinners Christ died for us. But then the next verse in chapter 5, it talks about this kind of profound truth that while we were enemies, we, recon- we were reconciled by his death. Now look how profound and deep this is. That we, no matter how, where we were brought in a, in a, in a Christian religious house or respective, we have all gone astray and develop that kind of a spirit of independent, uh, uh, not kind of disobedience that we sort of a, became at enmity with God, the loving God. But he said he reached out to us and gave Christ for us, died for us by his amazing grace to kind of bring us back. Now, I, we gave one illustration last week, and I wonder if I can uh, repeat it. We, we, th- we said, for example, if... if Ben Laden, when he was alive, and they, they had, what, $25 million on his head to you know, bring him dead or alive. If supposedly the United States government decided, or a president, this will never happen, but decided to say, well, if you, you seek forgiveness and you repent, uh, we, we will forgive you. And we we're not going to condemn you. We're not going to take you to judgment. This is mercy. Mercy is not is having the person who committed a crime or committed a sin or committed something wrong not pay for it, not be judged for it. This is mercy. And we were truly saved by his mercy. But grace goes beyond this. If they send him a letter and say, Mr. Bin Laden, if you're willing to repent, not only we will forgive you for what you have done, but we will give you the American citizenship. And you can come here, and you actually can practice your rights as an American, even run for elections in the United States. This, and you become a child of America, a son, one of the sons of America. This is amazing grace. But uh, if it goes even beyond and saying that we were going to try one of us on your behalf and have him or her condemned for your crimes, this is really amazing grace. So this is exactly what happened on the cross. It's just amazing. Uh, John Newton, who, uh, um, you know, just as a background, you've, you've all heard Amazing Grace and the song. The one who composed it, it was a, was a vile sinner. He was a slave trader. And he uh, was drunk, and he was the, a sailor, and just a terrible person. But, but then when he accepted Christ, it kind of behooved him. How would God? would give grace and it would change him from a sinner to a child of God. The same is true with Saul who became Paul. The enemy, he said, I was not only a blasphemer, I was a persecutor of the church. I mean, look at the tremendous change of Mary of Magdalene, who was kind of a, uh, was controlled by evil spirits, seven evil spirits, and then becomes a saint. This woman who was an adulterous woman, and the Lord would have mercy on her, and said, I will not judge you, but go and sin not. Can you imagine this kind of a, and he, and he, he addresses her as ma'am, as, like as, a, as a daughter, as a respected person. This is amazing grace. 
And that kind of amazing grace is what brings us to salvation. When you accept Christ as personal Savior, you're saying, Lord, I come just as I am. I'm a vile sinner, but I need your amazing grace, and I want to become a child of yours. And I want to repent for my sins, and I'm going to walk now in obedience. So let's read very few verses. And the main text that we're reading from is from Titus 2, 10 to 12. I mean, this kind of, we're going to start from verse 11. Titus, second chapter, and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. We talked about the school of grace. Yes, you can become a child of God through grace, but then as a child, there is a schooling process. We said it's like going into engineering school or law school or medical school. All right. So what it, does it teach us? It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. In other words, you cannot live that grace life while pursuing worldly lusts, your own lusts. We should live soberly, that is wisely, righteously, and godly in the present age. I'm going to skip to the next uh, uh, one, uh, if we can move, not Ephesians, for, for, I'm going to read that. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and verse 8, uh, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 13 to 5. Although I was formerly, look, look at Paul, he was formerly Saul, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. See, the term in Greek was like overwhelming. Was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now let me tell you this. This is very profound and very true. The story of Saul, who was such a vile sinner and he killed people. Among Christians, he killed people. He was a murderer. He was a, you know, prime time terrorist. What do you call them? The kind of the enemy number one or whatever of, of believers. I mean, he tortured them. And one of them is the martyr, Stephen. The fact that the Lord would allow him, would transform him and adopts him and brings him to be child of his is a reflection that there is room for any person, irrespective of what were your sins or my sins in the past. It's an illustration that you're never too far from the grace of God. See, this is kind of an illustration of the amazing, amazing grace. Now, let the three things here in the text, let's revert back to that test in, uh, text in Titus. Three things. It says, and, and I'm going to read them again, teaching us denying worldly lusts, we should live, number one, wisely, righteously, and godly in the present age. So what the Lord is asking us to live in wisdom, and we want to talk about these three, this trinity, these three dimensions, in righteousness, that is in holiness, and third thing, in godliness. And we're going to define each one of them, because like they, they could be foreign language. You know, when I first read the text, this was like foreign language to me. You know, I had no idea what it was. So, so I, you had to search it through scriptures and find out first is what the Lord is calling us. Let's revert. I'm sorry for whoever is following the slides. You're doing a great job, brother. Just keep up with me. Um, you know, move, move forward. Uh, and the Lord is on your side. The grace of God is with you. Next, next, next. And next. Next. Perfect. There we are. First thing, wisdom and insightfulness. The first thing is wisdom and insightfulness. And this is what the Lord does. What, what is wisdom? What is, you know, some people understand wisdom that, well, you have to be a little bit cunning or, you know, or, or wit. No, no, no. This is not what he's talking about. It's having that kind of spiritual insight and discernment. What? About what? Discernment about what? It's being able to differentiate things. You know, a wise man or a woman is a person who knows their weakness, who knows their tendencies, 
and they watch out. That's why it says soberly. We know after we experience grace that we might be trapped. First of all, you realize that you're not in a picnic. You're in a warfare. You're a spiritual warfare. Other people don't have the spiritual eyes to see that. But you have it. And the enemy of your soul is trying to trap you. He wants to trap you again because you were a slave to sin and you were freed and you were captured by him. Now he's looking for you to bring you back to trap you. And you realize you're spiritual and there are traps. So you watch out. This is why the Lord said, he said, be wise like who? Serpents. All right? Meek like dove. Now listen. Wise like serpents? Yes. Because you can put a trap and catch all sorts of animals, but the serpent, watch out. They're always alert, always quick. And this is why be aware of the traps of the enemy and your tendency to fall back and sin. A wise person who has, for example, diabetes and controlled diabetes takes his medication every day, whether it's oral hyperglycemic or insulin. You need to be having a new kind of injection of grace every day. You need that kind of power to live above sin and live and experience grace. Second, do you know what? It's very important. You become wise after you read the scriptures. Yesterday, a pastor here was speaking Arabic about Samson. How he was so strong, he was a judge for the Lord in the Old Testament, and how he was trapped and he has fallen. And he said, look, Samson was a fool. Because he saw the trap of the enemy and he fell in it. Brothers and sisters, you cannot experience grace by trying to deceive God and experience and do practice what they call as cheap grace. Listen very carefully now. You cannot live cheap grace. What is cheap grace? No, no. You can't come to the Lord and repent to your sins and then say, Lord, no, you're a forgiving God, and then I just want to continue in sin because you're a forgiving God. It's okay. If there are no awards, I won't take awards, but my salvation, once saved, always saved. You cannot cheat God because, no, listen, it costs quite a bit. And you have to be sober and realize that if you sin after experiencing grace, God is a fair judge. Now let me give you one quick example. Listen. Because he is gracious and loving, it doesn't mean that you can continue in sin. It's very important. Because repeatedly in the Old Testament and New Testament that he says, he has no, he makes no favors, he has no nepotism. He has no favoritism. He cannot do for you now because you're a child of God. You say you're my child. You see, President Trump, you know, brought members of his family. Jared, you know, people put him in a high place and gave him all. And uh, what's his daughter's name? Uh, uh, I forgot her name. In Volca, whatever it is. And, and he put her in like a, a consultant. And people say, based on what? This is nepotism. This is favoritism. God has no favoritism, even though you're a child of his. If you sin, you're going to receive punishment by God. You cannot experience God's love and forgiveness because he's a fair judge. And you are held to a higher standard as a child of God. Prince Philip, the heir to the throne, and he wanted to live the way he lived. He said, no, 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 wait a minute. You're a child of the king, queen and the king, and wait a minute. You cannot live the way they want. Third, you cannot experience grace without commitment to the Lord. This is part of the principle of grace. Yes, you cannot experience grace and deliverance from sin and then live like the devil, but you cannot live with lack of commitment. It's all based on true consecrated life. We cannot live and experience grace without having a sense of priority for the things of God. It takes wisdom to know the basic principles of grace. Delivering grace, amazing grace. Yes, the Lord would bless you, but you have to be among the committed. And let me tell you, the sense of priority and commitment is so important. Look, the things of the, 
When we were in the world, we were away from God. Our priority were the things of this world. We followed our lusts. We did what we wanted to do. If it feels good, then do it, and it's okay. But now it's a different kind of era. It's a different world. It's a different kingdom. And you cannot live that way, and you cannot live without commitment. You see, the, most of the Christians today, the true believers, they want to kind of practice religion on Sunday and then live the way they want, and no commitment to spiritual things. Now, I want to ask you today, we are committed to the things of, the practical things of how we can make our bodies fit. I mean, I look at many of you, and you're really in good shape. And I think you spend some time in exercising. Some, some of you spend some time in eating, making sure that they, you know, you're well fed. Nobody starves themselves. Maybe you're not exercising, but at least you don't stay for like three to four days without drinking or, or eating food. No, do you? I think, you know, some of you are trying to be on crash diet, but I don't think you're going to starve yourself that long. But look, how do we starve our lives from spiritual things? Where are the things of God? You're a child of the king. Where are the things of the kingdom? Are there on the list of priorities? Are you a soldier of the cross? Are you a servant of the Lord? Are you really committed once you become a child of God, may God give you that kind of wisdom to realize that you cannot experience that grace without a transformed life and without commitment and a deep sense of priorities. Look what it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things shall be added unto you. What are these things? The blessings of God. His protection, His preservation, His providence. But you have to seek God with all your heart. You know, when I was on campus at the American University of Beirut, you know, I had friends who were, who were uh, communists. And they were committed to their cause. They were on fire for the Lord. I had some people who are, you know, from other kind of committed, Islamists or whatever, they're committed. And I always thought, well, I respect them. I disagree with them. But I respect them for the commitment. And then I looked at some of the Christians saved by grace. And look. They have no backbone, no commitment. They make the look of wow, cheap grace, big time. You have to be committed to the God who saved you, to the Christ who saved you. And this is the only way you can experience grace. You give him time, you give him priority, you serve him, you are in his house before everybody else. You're a servant of the living God. You're a servant leader because you're a child of God. 2 Timothy 3.7, it talks about the lack of wisdom in this age. Ever, it says, ever learning, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Isn't this what happens around you? They're always learning, and they have these PhDs and all of these degrees, and EDDs and DDs and whatever it is, and DDT and all of that kind of thing. But listen. But they have no wisdom. Last time we said that if you look at the kind of how the rate of people kind of reaching out to kind of Google, every second there is 40,000 people kind of reaching out for some information every second. In one day it's 3.5 billion. We're more informed, but we're much less wise. We have no spiritual insight. We have no spiritual insight. And in Romans 1.22, it describes this age. Although they claim to be wise, they became fools. I love these words of Jim Elliot, the person who saved the Lord, served the Lord in Ecuador, and then he gave his life out there. At a young age, a graduate, a kind of a... Uh, from the best universities, he goes there and puts his life, and then they kill him. But before he is martyred for the Lord, he says he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Look at how we kind of follow dreams that are just illusions. You invest your time in things that have no worth. 
But at the end of the day, you have little investment in the things that are eternal, that will build your life and prepare you to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brothers, sisters, stop thinking like little children. In regard to evil, be infants, but when it comes to your wisdom, be like adults. You see kind of the words here, how profound they are. Oh, God, help us. Let me tell you this. He's telling you, be childlike. When it comes to evil, that is, be innocent, be like children, childlike, in terms of innocence. But when it comes to wisdom, be, think like adults. Don't be childish. Be childlike, but don't be childish. Be mature. And Jen, James 1, ver, uh, chapter 1, 5 to 6, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And will be given to you, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. And seek without wavering. No one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Do you know what they're saying? If you want to have wisdom, be a man or a woman of prayer, who seeks God without wavering. And be a man and a woman with a commitment and no wavering in your life. And you'll have wisdom of God. Be a Christ-filled, Christ-controlled, spirit-filled, spirit-controlled believer. And James, he can put content to that wisdom. He who is wise and understanding among you let, you, let them show it by good life. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first pure. Haha, <laughs> now we go back. What is true wisdom? It's its content is purity, and it is peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. It has a character in it. That we this kind of prelude to righteousness. And this is why it gives you the kind of the kind of the Lord gives you that beautiful parable of the virgins and says these were foolish virgins, vir virgins who went in and the, when the Savior came, they had no oil in the lamp. Oil is a reference to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of discernment, the Spirit of holiness. Whereas those kind of wise virgins, they had oil. They were spirit controlled. Spirit controlled. Yesterday there was a beautiful illustration of how men like in the men who were Christ like in the Old Testament, like Daniel, and these kind of young men with him, Shadrach and Meshach and Abdenago, and what a great impact they had in changing the nation, the kind of one of the strongest nations. And it says gives you a beautiful illustration of part of their Christ likeness, they were wise. They put high regard to the things of God. They were obedient unto death. Daniel was willing to go to the lion's den for the sake of Christ and forfeit everything. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they put them in the fiery furnace, but they did not kind of give up on the living God. And these are the kind of wise people because they regard and they give attention to the things that they cannot lose more than the things they cannot keep. May God give you wisdom. Today you say, Lord, give me kind of that spirit of discernment that I would value the things, your things, the things of God, more on than all of these things of the world. And I know that the enemy is trying to trap me and kind of pursue me on a daily basis. And I be, be, want to be equipped I want to carry the spoil sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, on a daily basis. And then the shield of faith. I want to be ready for the fight. And I cannot do it without you. Second is purity and righteousness. Live righteously. This amazing great is, uh, grace is a transforming grace. It changes you. Now, you've heard the beautiful illustration of my brother Salim of this kind of white white garment or whatever, which is very true. But look, this is the prelude. This is step one. 
imputed righteousness, that is when you put this white kind of garment on you, the Lord would see you through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is imputed righteousness. But this is not a substitute to living in righteousness. Actually, this should be the foundation and the prelude to living in righteousness. Imputed righteousness, which is the fact that now the Lord is going to see you through Jesus Christ, when you accept his salvation, you accept him as a personal Savior and Lord, is not a substitute to living in righteousness. But it's the prelude, the necessary pre-requirement to living in righteousness, to implied righteousness. Yes, there is no sinless perfection. You may sin, but you don't have to sin. You have the power of Christ in you. When a thought comes to you, because it all starts in the mind and in your thought life, which is contrary to the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of Christ, you can divert it to the cross and say no to it, Lord, crucify it. No. And the fact that you say no, there is power from above and say, Lord, I want your thoughts and mind. I want your spirit. And you can have victory inside and you can have victory outside. Galatians 5.24, it says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Look, the people around you are going to see something different about you, men and women. They're going to look at you, whether in the workplace, whether you're at the university, whether you are in, a, in practice, whether you're at home, if you have children, they're going to, your children are going to look at you and say, look, there is something amazing about this person. There is something amazing about this person. They live the life of Christ in purity, in righteousness, in holiness. I know that holiness has become a world, old-fashioned word. But look, terms in the Bible do not become anything else because they're not fashionable. And sin should not be accepted because it is fashionable. Listen, it's very important. Living a righteous life is living a Christ-like life. First Thessalonians 4.3, it is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And we avoid it because we avoid it in the mind and we make provisions not to fall into it. For God's provision for a man and woman is to have a relationship only through marriage. Yes, it's not fashionable, but it's the truth of God. It's the only thing that would give you life abundant and life eternal. First Peter 1, 14, 16, it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you have been, you have lived with in ignorance, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. There is be holy, because I will make you holy. I am holy and I will make you holy. I will make you holy. Exception is not the rule. Yes, you may sin, but this should not be the rule. Now, we, we have sort of diluted this truth today that you go to some churches and tell you, no, 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 we sin every minute. We need grace. No, what they're talking about, that we're imperfect every minute. But we're talking about sin, which is the transgression of the law, the sin, which is the a transgression of the law, that you know this is wrong and you do it. You have power not to do it. You have power not to do it. And if you do it and you continue doing it, you're going to pay the consequences of that sin. But if you do it and you want to rep you do repent and turn it around, you have to truly repent. And you can confess these things to the Lord and say, I'm truly repentant and I want to forego what I've done. So you can turn to the Lord today. It's like we are immune compromised. You know what? Immune compromised. We don't have immunity. Now, Dr. Wong can understand what I'm talking about. But what happens to you in salvation is that you get enhancement to your immunity. It's like the vaccine. Instead of getting influenza, I said, I will give you a vaccine. 
and you will have immunity against sin. Yes, you can get that infection. But you don't have to get that infection. You have power within to overcome it. Now, I think my time is up. The last thing is fellowship and godliness. What is godliness? What is godliness? Look, it says in scriptures that these people, 2 Timothy 3, 5, you have a lot of religious people that have the form of godliness, but deny its power. What does that mean? What do they have the form of godliness? It's being religious on the outside. Yes, you attend church or you attend whatever is the worship places, but they don't have the power to live a pure, triumphant life. They're hypocrites. And you can be one of those, and I can be one of those. But just being a churchgoer and go and practice religion from the outside, and on Sunday or whatever day it is, they see us and, oh, how beautiful and pure and holy and sweet. But in our secret life, we're living like devils, like little devils. He says this is not godliness. Godliness is having the character and the contact, conduct that is consistent with God and the Son of God. You have a character and you have a conduct that consistent with Christ himself. You live like Christ based on a strong connection and fellowship with God. You see, it's like the plant. I love the cedar trees because I come from Lebanon. There are a lot of cedar trees. Some of you have seen them with me when we went there. But the cedar tree is the beauty of the cedar tree above for every kind of centimeter above the ground, there are three centimeters of roots under the ground, the hidden light, the hidden part of the cedar tree. This is what makes it strong. There is the hidden part of the roots of that tree that go in the rocks down there to kind of go and bring water to that kind of big tree and bring life. The same thing with a godly, Christ-centered, Christ-connected, Believer, you're godly because you're connected with God. You have a daily fellowship. It's a, not only a relationship, it's a deep fellowship. You're in love with him, like your best friend. Like his best friend. You know, something that happened to me when I, started, when I got engaged to my, my current wife, Lamia, is that we were in love and I used to spend love the time we spent together. And I tell you now, 36 years later, I can't tell you how valuable the time we spend with each other. But I say it with all truthfulness. How valuable is the time I spend with my Lord and Savior, my best friend. I love to spend time with him. I love to talk to him during the day. I like to spend time on his word. I like to kind of hear his voice. This is godliness. And as you do this, he transforms you into Christ-likeness. He shapes you. It's like a plastic surgery that happens to you every day. And every day you're more beautiful and more look like him. This is what is called the Christ-likeness. This is the goal of your salvation. They see God in you because you're connected to God. You know, Michael Jackson, many people have heard about him. You know how many plastic surgeries he did? And at the end, with more, every plastic surgery, he would kind of look uglier. Didn't, didn't you see it? I mean, you can tell. But not spiritually when you were with Christ. You become more like him. And even when you go through difficult times, you're transformed into Christ-likeness. I like Amy Carmichael when she took them to kind of show them how they, they work out, they purify the gold to make it 24 carat. Do you know what 24 carat means? Gold? It means that has no impurities. And then the person was working on that kind of a, the iron that he brings from there, from the mine, and he's kind of putting it into fire and changing it. And she asked him the question, and she said, by the way, Amy Carmichael is, was a missionary to India, and she had these students with her. And she told there, and she told him, sir, how do you know when it really gets to 24 carats? It's pure gold. He said, when I look at it and I see my face. 
This is how people know that you're a true Christian when they look at you and see the face of Christ, the character of Christ. Because you're connected to Christ. You're connected to Christ. And it says here, Therefore I urge you, my brothers and sisters, of you of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him. Every day commit your life to Him. Have a fellowship with Him. Psalm 51, 17, it says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise this. I love it when Billy Graham, when they asked him this question, he said, Mr. Graham, don't you know God is dead? He said, amazing. When did this happen? I just talked to him. <laughs> so, brothers and sisters, keep talking to him, and he talks to you. At the end, I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, that we can bring the fire to our lives. Today, submit your lives to the Lord. I like in Genesis 22, 7, when Isaac spoke to his dad, Abraham, when he was kind of, Abraham was trying to give him a sacrifice. He said, and he asked him, Father, and he said, yes, my son. He said, where is? The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And he didn't tell him that you are the lamb, and the Lamb of God that someday is going to be Jesus Christ. But today we have the Lamb. And he was offered on the offering. And we have the wood, which is the cross. But where is the fire in your life? It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. You have to put yourself on the cross and say, I'm crucified with Christ, so that not I should live, but Christ should live through me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for your amazing grace. Lord, we cannot deceive you. We cannot cheat you. You've given so much. You've loved us. We call you Father. We just want to be, give all our lives to you and go into that deep relationship with you where we really experience your amazing love and amazing grace and make it known to the people around us. We want to be men and women on a mission. We want to submit our lives. We want to surrender our lives. We want to surrender all. Oh Lord, cleanse us this morning from all impurity. Give us that kind of spirit of discernment and wisdom. Make us pure as you are pure. And give us, Lord, the joy of being connected to you. Where you talk and walk with us all day long until we see you face to face. We pray all of this in your precious and powerful name, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs>